Okay, let me start by uh, asking if there are any questions about uh, abelian churn simons theory and how it turns particles into fermions or anions more generally. Yes. Yes. And then we worked out from this A and that was from this A. Yes. I don't even know how we got there. Uh, so the, okay, let me start from something simpler. Do you know about the, the gauge vector potential of a magnetic solenoid? Does that, okay. Well, I can spend the two, five minutes reminding you about it. It would be hard to give justice to this thing because I'm basically using the Aron of Bohm construction and then the linearity of the Chern Simons equations of motion to, call, to give that expression. But if you don't know the Aron of Bohm effect, do you? Yeah, yeah so you don't know. I, I, unfortunately, I, I, I don't think it, I could make justice to the Aron of Bohm effect in five minutes. So one thing you could do today in the evening is to just study the Aron of Bohm effect. I was assuming that you know the Aron of Bohm effect, and if you do not, I won't be able to make justice to this thing in five minutes. Yeah, just learn about it and, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so I wanted to now discuss two additional small topics, uh, small comments more, about the Charles Simons theory, and then we'll start discussing uh, fluctuating anions, not just probe anions like second quantized anions. So far we discussed first quantized anions, so to speak. Okay. So the first comment is a special case, which we will actually use, <clears throat> which is U1 level one. I'll give you basic, I'll teach you a few new dualities that have emerged recently. Um, in, but some, some of them will involve U1 level one, Chern Simon's theory. Uh, this, well, this notation means k equals one. U1, sometimes people write U1 level k. Okay. So U1 level one is uh, the particular model i over four pi a wedge dA. Uh, that's a special case of uh, these guys. So when k is odd and it's equal to one, we see that we have two lines. One line, one Wilson line is this, and the other is just this. So these are the two Wilson lines that we got, or the two anions. Uh, this is the anion with the spin, so we read out the spin from this formula. This is the anion of spin a half, you plug Q equals one, K equals one. So this is the anion of spin a half, and this is the anion mod, mod one, I just said one in Hebrew. And this is the anion of spin zero, mod one, okay? A special thing about U1 level one is that there are no fractional spins. Only, well, oh, sorry. <laughs> there, are no, uh, there, are no really, there are no real anions. There is a spin a half and spin zero. And in addition, all the Aharon of bomb phases are trivial. So both when Q and Q prime are either zero or one, since K is one, this is always one. So all the braiding phases are trivial. So we have trivial braiding. So that's a funny, that's a funny case. Um, it's a funny and very subtle case where there is no braiding, there are no, no round of bomb phases to measure at long distances. And all the theory got is that like two, two possible probe particles, one a boson and one a fermion. So for this reason, people call it a triv trivial spin theory. So that's, that's a trivial topological field theory but it's a spin theory because it has a spin a half anion. So this is a trivial uh, spin theory. Just because there are no braiding phases to measure at long distances, there, is, there are no Aron of bomb phases in this system, and there are no particles of genuinely fractional spin, so to speak. So uh, this, you have to bear in mind that if 
the low energy effective filter is U1 level one, it's as good as saying that the theory has some massive fermions and that's it. So there is nothing to measure at long distances. Unless you try to put the theory in a compact space with some cycles and then there is some spin structure, your fermion may respond to this. But just in flat space, there is nothing to measure. Is that clear? So U1 level one should be deemed as a trivial theory or an almost trivial theory. Okay, this is the fact number one that I want to tell you about. Fact number two is what I was asked about in the previous lecture, which I promised to address, which is what happens when we combine the kinetic term, which leads to the ordinary propagating waves and Maxwell's equation, with the chern simons term. This is ADA, and this is a so this is an interesting system. It's still quadratic. You can exactly solve it. Uh, so this is still a quadratic system. It's exactly solvable. And you can compute the propagator. You can compute the spins of all the excitations. And uh, let me just make a claim about it. And to show that this claim is true would be a homework exercise. So there are several claims. Let me just write, uh, there, these are claims. Uh, it's a quadratic model, so your exercise is to just prove it at home. Uh, this is a homework exercise. So first of all, unlike the ordinary Maxwell theory, of course here there are no massless particles. So there is no massless photon. Uh, for otherwise, this whole story about chern simons would be wrong. Indeed, notice that here there are two derivatives, and here there is one derivative. So at long distances, the less derivatives you got, the better. So this is a more important thing in low, at long distances. So at very, very long distances, you can drop the kinetic term. And the theory is described by these funny anions, and that's it. So the first part of the claim is that long distances, we just go to pure, we just, uh, we just have the pure churn simons. At long distances, we have pure churn simons. Namely, there are anions and are on of bond phases, and that's it. There is no propagating stuff at long distances. But there is a, in this theory, there is an excitation with finite mass. There is a finite mass excitation. So there is a particle whose mass is a, of the order of g squared k, and your job is to compute it, like the four pi's and two pi's. But the mass goes like g squared times k. The second thing is that the spin of this particle is k over absolute value of k. So it's uh, plus minus one. For positive k, the spin of this particle is a uh, one. And for negative k, the spin of that particle is minus one. Remember that we're in two plus one dimensions, so the spin is an eigenvalue of SO2. And therefore, spin one and minus one are different representations. So the spin is either plus or minus one depending on the sign of k and depending on your conventions. So it flips spin, that's the important thing. This, um, and this is essentially the massive photon, okay? So what happened, the churn simons term is like a mass term for the photon. So the photon was massless, and the churn simons term is like a mass term, and it gives it mass. And since the spin is plus minus one, that also makes contact with my previous claim that the spin is only defined mod one intrinsically. So now you can perhaps understand it better. Because once you take Chern Simons theory, you add some heavy particles, you add a kinetic term for the gauge field. So there appears in the spectrum a spin one excitation, which is the massive photon. So you can always take that massive photon and put it on top of an anion. The massive uh, photon is a good particle. It doesn't have any around of bomb phases. It's a true particle in the theory. So you can just stick this particle on top of anions. And that's why the spin is intrinsically defined only modulo one. Because you cannot know the spin of an, an you cannot know whether this anion has a you know, massive photon attached to it or not. Okay, so these two things you can show by uh, studying very carefully using the LSZ procedure, the propagator of the gauge field. You have to decompose it into representations and look for the pole and blah, blah. And one interesting fact about this story is that if you study the two-point function of the gauge field, you'll find some confusing pole. It's a very famous confusion. If you just study the propagator of AA, you'll discover that there is a funny pole at zero momentum, but it's unphysical, and you have to try to understand why. So once the, the idea should be, I'm giving you a hint, 
look at gauge invariant two-point functions. In gauge invariant two-point functions, there are only physical equations. Okay? So this is your homework exercise. So therefore, when we discuss duality, next, I will often write both the kinetic term and the trans Hamilton's term, but you should understand that the kinetic term is negligible at long distances because it has more derivatives than the trans Hamilton's action. Yes? Right, I often use a shorthand notation where I don't even write the wedge. Calculate, prove this plane. Well, uh, this, there is nothing to do. You just prove this claim that, there are only, that the only excitation in this theory is a massive photon. So at energy, okay, so if, you, if you are like an ordinary, you know, just a, gr a graduate student and you don't know anything uh, about this, then you would say, okay, there is a massive particle and therefore the theory at long distances is trivial and gap, right? That's not true in Chern's Hamilton's theory. Even though there are no massless particles, the long distance theory still has measurable macroscopic phenomena. What are these measurable macroscopic phenomena? You take anions, you adiabatically move them at long distances, and you find phases. So the long distance theory is pure churn simons theory, but there is some uh, stuff going on at finite mass. Yes? I, I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Oh, why do I, uh, oh, uh, because I, I'm just, uh, you know, sloppy. I don't have to wedge. Well, you always, in, here and here, I'm abusing notation. The Lagrangian can be viewed as a zero form. So if I was to write the Lagrangian, I strictly speaking need to put here a Hodge star. Yeah. Or you can view the Lagrangian as a tree form and then you integrate a tree form. But to view the Lagrangian as a tree form, I have to uh, write this guy uh, as a star of F wedge star F. I'm just assuming that you know what I mean when I write this thing. When you, when you write it in components, you don't have a choice. There is only one thing you can write. So you'll figure it out. Any other question? Okay, so let me tell you about uh, the first, just one more piece of uh, history, uh, which is uh, very cute, and people often confuse that piece of history with uh, duality. So this is a piece of history, uh, which is essentially what I already told you, but uh, I wanna make it a little bit more precise. So now we study chern simons matter theory. Okay, that's how it's chern simons matter. chern simons matter means that we have a gauge field, we have particles that are charged under the gauge field, and we have possibly a kinetic term for the gauge field. But as I've argued, the kinetic term is sort of, uh, in the, you don't really need to write it down. It's clear that it's there, but uh, we don't really need to write it down to do the analysis that I'm going to do. So let's consider the Lagrangian. That's gonna be our main Lagrangian uh, for the next couple of uh, minutes. So we have a kinetic term for the gauge field. Uh, even though I don't need, really need to write it down. Then we have churn simons term at level one, okay? So this is the no, first non-trivial generalization of particle vortex duality, comes from, oh, I'm, I'm using it, okay. So, let's just... so there, then we have a particle, we have a scalar field, which uh, is charged under the gauge field, and then we have a mass for the scalar field, and then we have a quartic piece. And let me put a hat on everything because previously I denoted this scalar field with a hat. Okay, that's the model. Uh, if you wanna just be, uh, the way you could refer to this model is U1 level one plus one. That's how you would see this model appearing in the literature. So this uh, kind of shorthand writing explains everything here. You just write the most general Lagrangian for U1 level one churn simons theory, coupled to a, a scalar field of charge one. Okay, so people would often write it like that. So it's a very interesting model that's related to many applications in condensed matter physics, and it also appears very naturally in particle physics. 
And my plan was to explain how it appears in particle physics in the last lecture, and I hope to get to it. So the, it's a very interesting model. I want to talk about one particular limit, which we already analyzed. And I'm again using this uh, floppy notation that by that I mean that m squared is huge, positive, bigger than any parameter in the Lagrangian. So this, this, this limit we've already analyzed. In this limit, the, the, the gauge field is not Higgs, and you get any ant. Is that agreeable? That's exactly what we just analyzed. It's the first quantized picture of the any ant. So we get, the, the, we get any ant. But as I've just told you, uh, for U1 level one, there aren't really any non-trivial any ants. There are just two, uh, exit, just two objects of spin zero and spin a half. So which, what is the spin a half object? The spin a half object is interesting. The spin a half object is essentially phi. So the main uh, observation about this model in the large mass limit is that um, the phi particle which started its life as a boson, it's a scalar field like, uh, like any other scalar field you know, it's actually a fermion. It becomes a fermion in this phase. So it's a fermion. What is the mechanism that makes this particle into a fermion? The mechanism is flux attachment. Uh, it started its life as a scalar field with electric charge one, but then there is this magnetic flux that pierces the particle and leads to a non-trivial phase when these two particles uh, are, are exchanged, okay? So phi and phi starts its life as a bosonic particle with uh, boson statistics, but because of flux attachment, you get a minus sign. So the aron of bomb phase makes this particle into a fermion. So the mantra is that if you couple a scalar field to U1 level one chern simons theory, a fermion transmutes into a boson. This is not a boson-fermion duality. It's just a statement about the large mass limit that there is a heavy excitation, which is a fermion. So we have a heavy, fer heavy fermion excitation in the Hilbert space. So we have a fer heavy fermion excitation in the Hilbert space. You remember that we discussed the response of the churn, who asked this question? You remember that we discussed the response of the churn simons theory to putting anions? Uh, to putting like uh, electric charge density? So the main point was that uh, when we take an electric charge density, uh, which corresponds to one particle of charge one, in churn simons theory at level one, it would acquire a magnetic field w with one unit. So, So phi, I have this picture here. Phi starts its life as an electrically charged particle with one unit of charge. Now, since our level K here is equal to one, the magnetic field that pierces it and makes it into a solenoid is also one unit of magnetic field, okay? We, we have this formula for the magnetic field and you plug K equals one, you will see that the magnetic field is one unit. So we have a magnetic field with one unit. So while phi starts its life as a scalar field with uh, you know, Bose statistics, because of this magnetic field, when you have two such particles and you exchange them, you get a minus sign. Why do you get a minus sign? Because if you exchange them by 360 degrees, you get the plus. And if you do it a halfway, you get a minus. Okay? So that's a special case of the formula for the spin which is Q squared over 2K, and you plug uh, Q equals one and K equals one, so you find spin a half. So uh, the fact is that in the large mass limit of this model, we have a heavy fermion excitation. No, the, the spin statistics theorem does not say that. The spin statistics theorem says that uh, if you have uh, fermions in the Hilbert space, their statistics is fermionic. 
And this is, this is upheld by this model. The spin statistics theorem does not say that scalar fields in the Lagrangian cannot create fermionic excitations when you act on the vacuum. Yeah. So because of the flux attachment, uh, there is actually a very beautiful paper that explains how that works by uh, uh, Alfred. I mean, there is a paper that ex exactly addresses your concern. It's a very famous paper from the 70s by Alfred, Alfred Goldhaber. He actually discusses not exactly this problem, but some other problem, but has, that has some parallels with this problem. And he explains how the spin statistics theorem is consistent with all this kind of stuff. Any other questions? So, yes? This particular, I'm talking about three dimensions here, and many things I'm saying are particular to 3D. But the general phenomenon that some scalar, scalar operators acting on the Hilbert space can turn into fermionic excitations, that also happens in four dimensions. And the paper of Alfred Goldhaber is about that phenomenon in four dimensions, actually. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, Okay, so one can be one can be very optimistic here that uh, maybe we can go beyond first quantization like we did with particle vortex duality. Maybe, uh, maybe this model, you know, even in the quantum regime where the mass of the anion is small and this anion is fluctuating, so you can think about this fermion. This fermion gets light. When the mass of phi goes down, the fermion go, becomes light and it's fluctuating, so maybe we get an interesting fermionic phase transition, okay? That's the intuition. So let, let's, let's try to see if this, this makes sense. So we have our usual diagram, m hat squared. So at very large positive mass, we have U1 level one topological field theory. But as I told you, U1 level one topological field theory is kind of trivial. Okay, we have U1 level one topological field theory. It's, a, it's actually trivial. We have a heavy fermion of spin one half. And I emphasize that the spin is plus one half, not minus one half. It's very important. It's not the same. So we have a heavy fermion excitation. We have a fermi heavy fermion excitation of spin plus one half. Another thing about that limit is that the magnetic symmetry is unbroken. How do I know that it's unbroken? Does anybody see an argument immediately? Why do we, how do we know that the magnetic symmetry is unbroken in this phase? Anybody has an idea? What if it were broken? Yes, but I said that trans Simon's theory has no massless degrees of freedom, right? So that's it. The long distance limit in this limit is, is trivial. We just integrate out phi, we get a trans Simon's theory at level one, and I told you that if you solve for the propagator, you would see that there are no massless particles. So therefore, you want magnetic symmetry must be unbroken. Okay, let's analyze the negative mass limit, large negative mass squared limit. And that, in that limit, the gauge symmetry is Higgs. There are clearly no massless particles. So you want magnetic is unbroken. And there are no massless it's gapped. Also here it's gapped. And well, there isn't much to say, but let's think a little bit about more about a little bit more about that limit. In that limit, you remember that in in the absence of a churn simons interaction, we had an interesting excitation, which was the vortex, which had finite energy. Does everybody remember that? That's from an hour ago. We had this configuration where we had, a, we, had, we had this action that looked like D, D phi hat minus B squared. And that led to an interesting vortex configuration with finite energy in this limit. And we could create this vortex, magnetic vortex configuration by acting with the monopole operator on the vacuum. 
You remember that? So now this is a this is slightly modified because we have a child Simon's term. So I called it A here now. So it's A. We have I over four pi A D A. So you have to revisit the problem of uh, magnetic vortices in the Higgs phase in the presence of churn simons theories, uh, churn simons uh, terms. In the absence of a churn simons term, it's just a bosonic particle with finite energy. The claim that I want to make here is that the churn simons interaction uh, makes this magnetic vortex in the Higgs phase into a fermionic vortex. So there is a fermionic vortex. And amazing, you can compute its spin. And the spin is not a half, it's minus a half. So there is a fermionic vortex, fermionic vortex particle of spin minus a half. So now you may try to, you can, you can, you can be bold. Which theories do you know that are gapped on both sides of the transition, have a heavy fermion of uh, spin plus a half on one side, and a heavy fermion of spin minus a half on the other side? Does anybody know such a model that has such, such, that has some prop, such properties? So it's gapped on both sides, has a fermion of spin a half on one side and a fermion of spin minus a half on the other side. Have you ever seen such a model? What are you looking? Massless fermion, the free massless fermion. So let's compare this model with the free massless fermion. So the, 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 the claim is that uh, when you second quantize this anion, it actually becomes a, ma a second quantized massless fermion, okay? So let's discuss the massless fermion model. It's an interesting model. We have psi dagger, d slash psi, with an i, and then a mass, a mass for psi. This is a complex uh, two plus one dimensional fermion and I'm using the three-dimensional gamma matrices to define this d slash. As a function of the mass, we have one special point, which is m equals to zero, where the fermion is massless. And this is a second order phase transition. So this is a second order phase transition. On either side of this, either sides of this transition, the spectrum is gapped. On one side, the fermion has spin a half because it's psi, that is the ground state, and on the other side, it's psi dagger. It's like the Zeeman effect. So here, the lightest particle is psi. Here, it's psi dagger. So here, we have a spin a half fermion in the Hilbert space, and we, here we have a spin minus a half fermion in the Hilbert space. So it's a striking similarity, and one can try to say that there is a duality. That, that This is like a generalization of particle vortex duality, but it's surprising because you start from a bosonic theory and you get a fermionic theory on the other side. So I want to now teach you how to run some consistency checks of this uh, surprising claim. So we'll run some, we want to run, I want to run now a non-trivial consistency check, but first let me state the claim and then uh, I'll teach you how to run a consistency check. So the claim is that U1 level one plus pi is dual to just lambda, or I called it psi. That's the duality in shorthand notation. Okay, this is the simplest example of bosonization above two dimensions. So this is bosonization or boson-fermion duality. In three dimensions. Unlike bosonization in two dimensions, which is a, an exact duality, here it's an infrared duality. Infrared in the same sense as we, that we explained before that the, the two sides have a completely different set of parameters. Here there is only one parameter. But on this side of the duality, there is the gauge coupling, the mass, la, sorry, the gauge coupling, the mass, and lambda, while here there is only this mass. So the number of parameters doesn't match. The number of degrees of freedom doesn't match, but they flow to the same tr phase transition, which is described by a single massless fermion. Okay? 
So let's try the dictionary, and then I'll teach you how to run the consistency check. Uh, and here there is some audience participation. So what does the operator phi hat squared map to? What's the fermionic avatar of psi hat squared? Very good, psi dagger psi. What about the magnetic symmetry? So the, we have U1 magnetic symmetry, which is generated by this uh, topological current, mu nu rho, f nu rho, with one over two pi. What does it map to on the other side? Phase of psi, this is called fermion number, fermion number symmetry. So it's a psi dagger gamma mu psi. It's a conserved current. It's just fermion number symmetry, which is preserved by the math. What about the fermion? The fermion itself is a gauge invariant excitation. What is the fermion on the other side of the duality? Hmm? I can't hear. Phi field is not gauge invariant. So the proposal here is that maybe it's the phi field. But the phi field creates a, the phi field is the, you're almost right. The phi field is this, uh, the phi field leads to this um, anion in, in this phase. Okay, in this phase, the phi field is basically uh, heavy and it's a spin a half anion or a spin a half particle. So you're almost, almost right. But the phi field is not a gauge invariant local operator. So to fix that, we need to multiply the phi field by the, the monopole operator, M1. And the way to see that is that this is charged under particle number symmetry. So therefore, this has to be charged under the magnetic symmetry. And this combination is gauge invariant when you put the dagger. And the intuition behind putting this uh, monopole operator is that in this phase, the monopole operator creates the magnetic vortex. So you see that that's the right answer, okay? So this is the, this is the map. This is the map between the two theories. Yes? Yes? Does the third line have anything to do with the first line? Ah, it's the same question that Nayan asked. Yeah, so. Well. You see in quantum field theory when you multiply local operators, it's not just the square. You don't just like do ordinary multiplication. The psi is a free field. In free field theory, when you multiply, then it's the same as multiplication in school. But this is an interacting model. When you multiply two monopole operators, then you have to take, there is some singularity because of the operator product expansion. And when you remove the singularity, what you would be left with is that. Because this side is interacting, so multiplication is not uh, done term by term. Any other questions? So, uh, unlike the previous example of particle vortex duality, whether this is true is an open question. Nobody has proven that this transition is second order in the bosonic model. In fact, nobody has proven that uh, this transition can be made into a second order transition when we take the coupling lambda to be very large. Remember that in the particle vortex example, there was an argument that if this coupling is large enough, it will be second order. I didn't tell you the argument, but there exists an argument. Here, there doesn't even exist such an argument. So whether or not the phase transition in this bosonic theory is second order is an open question. Uh, if it's second order, this conjecture is extremely likely to be correct. It passes many consistency checks, including one that I'll teach you now. But nobody has, this is not even, this is not even proven on the lattice. Uh, because putting Chern-Simons terms on the lattice is notoriously hard, okay? Nobody is uh, currently able to easily simulate uh, Chern Simon's meta theories on the lattice. So we don't know if this whole thing is true. But one may be optimistic and believe that in a few years uh, uh, this will be possible to test. Can you map what? Well, but that's what I did here. This is the mass operator on the fermionic side. And this is the mass operator on the bosonic side. For the more advanced students here, 
who have more time to do things. So try to show that this uh, magnetic vortex has a spin minus a half is an interesting exercise. It's not hard. You just have to write the formula for angular momentum correctly and it comes out. Okay, so now I want to show you how to run a consistency check. For that, I need to teach you a new concept, which is conductivity. Okay, uh, I'll teach you uh, a, a small new concept that uh, um, we will then use to run a consistency check on this model. It's a very cute consistency check. So suppose you're in three dimensions and you have a conserved current J mu. It doesn't matter what is the underlying Lagrangian and it doesn't matter um, whether it's fermionic or bosonic, all of that doesn't matter. If you study the two-point function of the current, let's say uh, you do it in uh, position space, there is a possibility to find on the right-hand side a non-trivial uh, delta function, which looks like that epsilon nu nu rho a d rho of the delta function of x. You can easily check that this is consistent with the conservation of the current because if you hit it with d mu, then this vanishes by the fact that the derivatives are symmetric with respect to their indices. So there might be additional terms, of course. The correlation function of two currents in two plus one dimensions is generally a very complicated business and it's not just a bunch of delta functions. But in particular, there is a delta function that's fairly odd and the coefficient of this delta function that's fairly odd is sometimes also called k, which is very confusing. So to avoid it, I'll call this coefficient by capital K, okay? This will be capital K rather than lowercase k. This coefficient is measurable in the lab. It's uh, the name of this, you can do some conductivity experiments uh, and uh, you can measure directly this coefficient k. This coefficient k is called the chiral conductivity. There is the normal conductivity and then there is the chiral conductivity. If you've ever studied the quantum Hall effect, this is the conductivity in the orthogonal direction rather than the direction where the current should have flown. This is called the chiral conductivity. So an interesting consistency check uh, of this duality is to compute the conductivity on the two sides of the phase transition in both cases and to check that it agrees. Hmm? Why is it called chiral? It's called chiral because the current, so normally when you have a theory of conductivity, you put an electric field and you get a current in the same direction. But this coefficient measures the current that's orthogonal to the electric field, okay? That's what happens in the quantum Hall effect, that there is a non-zero chiral conductivity. Okay. So now I wanna teach you a small fact. This is a fact about uh, uh, the conductivity of the free fermion. The conductivity in free fermion series. In free fermion series. So let's consider a problem which is, I mean, you should think about it as a logically disconnected problem from this whole business. So let's consider a free fermion and couple it to a background a vector potential A. This is now non-dynamical. That's why I denote it with a capital letter rather than a lowercase letter. And put a mass. So this in particular includes the coupling of A to the current, to fermion number, which is conserved. 
So if we can compute the partition function as a function of capital A, we should be able to extract the chiral conductivity from it. Okay? So what I'm trying to do now is to fish out this coefficient for the free massive fermion theory. That's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to compute the conductivity of the free massive fermion theory. Okay? So there is the following fact, which is due to Redlich. The person who found it was Redlich in 85 or 86, I don't remember, in the 80s. And uh, it's a one loop computation where you put A on the external legs and you run the fermion uh, in the loop. It's a one loop computation and you can argue that this one loop computation is exact. So what you find by uh, doing this computation is that delta K between positive mass, so what you find is that K of positive mass minus, that's what Redlich found, albeit in a different language, minus K of negative mass is one. And I guess I need to put a two pi here for the normalization to be correct. So, so the free fermion theory leads to a jump in the conductivity by one unit, in the conductivity of fermion number. So delta K here is one. So an interesting exercise is to try to compare that prediction with the jump in the conductivity of this model of the bosonic model. So the next step is to try to compute the conductivity in the bosonic model, which is what I'm going to do now, because that's really easy, okay? Is the statement about the free fermion here, the massive fermion, that the conductivity between the positive mass phase and the negative mass phase jumps by one? Is that statement clear? You can ask what about the conductivity in the negative mass phase, why can't we just compute that? The answer is that it's not determined by the free fermion theory. You can choose the conductivity in the negative mass phase to be whatever you want. The only physical thing is the difference. The conductivity in each of the phases is an arbitrary number, which you cannot compute from first principles in quantum field theory. Yes, so in, in the more advanced language, it's the level of the induced churn simons term for the background gauge field. And that's why you cannot compute it in each of the phases separately because it's ambiguous. You can add in the UV whatever level you want. But the difference is physical. So I wanna do now a small computation to just show you how the conductivity jumps in the bosonic theory, which furnishes a non-trivial consistency check of this duality. So in the bosonic theory, we have two phases, and we want to compute the difference in the conductivity of these two phases. So in this phase, um, first of all, we have to understand how to couple capital A. Capital A is the background field for the symmetry. Uh, here it couples to fermion number, and we already computed it. But, sorry, to fermion number. On the other side of the duality, the symmetry to which capital A needs to couple is the magnetic symmetry. So we take the bosonic Lagrangian, which we wrote on the blackboard before, and we add a new term, which is the coupling of a background gauge field to the magnetic symmetry. And that comes with one over two pi A wedge D A. So the, firm, the magnetic symmetry is D A, and A wedge D A is just the coupling of the background gauge field to the magnetic symmetry. So we should be, so the idea now is to, do, to try to do a small, to, do, to compute the change in the conductivity of the current to which A couples in the two phases. Now, in this phase, the gauge symmetry is Higgs. When the gauge field is Higgs, it means that it's massive, and we just put it to zero. So in this phase, uh, we just get zero, because we put this to zero and there, nothing remains. But in this phase, we have a U1, U1 level one topological filter. So the Lagrangian here, in this phase, is one over four pi I ADA 
in shorthand notation, plus 1 over 2 pi capital ABA. Okay. And as uh, Victor just remarked, yes? Oh, sorry. Uh, capital A is a non-dynamical uh, background vector potential, which couples to the conserved current of the theory. So the conserved current here is the magnetic symmetry. And on the fermionic side, the conserved current is psi dagger gamma mu psi. And that's what A couples to through the covariant derivative. So I computed, I used the result from the 80s for the jump in the conductivity for the fermionic theory. And now I'm trying to give you a quick proof that the same jump occurs in the bosonic theory. So I, I'm just trying to give you another consistency check of this uh, fantastic statement that uh, the quantized anion gives the free fermion. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. So this is our Lagrangian at very low energies in the large mass phase. We have a level one Chern Simons theory and this term. And here, the idea is to just, since it's, everything is quadratic, we just integrate out little a. So we just integrate, we complete it to a square and integrate it out. So we complete it to a square. So we write i over 4 pi a plus capital A, b a plus capital A. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Uh, this is right. And then I have to subtract uh, a, b, a. I put a minus sign here, sorry. I want to put a minus sign here to match the conventions. Uh, anyway, uh, and then ADA, we get ADA over a four pi, who is an I. Okay? So by changing variables now in the past integral, we get rid of this guy. And we get the churn simons term for the background gauge field at level one. That's the same as having a, a conductivity one. It's the same delta function. So the conductivity here is one, and here it's zero. So it's exactly the same jump. A more, a more condensed matter way to say that is that U1 level one topological field theory has nu equals one. It's called the integer quantum Hall effect. And by that, what people mean is that the conductivity is one in the integer quantum Hall effect. So if you knew a little bit about the integer quantum Hall effect, this would have been a completely stupid computation to do, because that's the definition of the integer quantum Hall effect, that it has in one unit of co conductivity. Well, in this phase, the conductivity is zero. So end of story. Okay? So we did some consistency checks where we checked the massive phases, we checked the map of operators, and we checked the jump in the conductivity. So it seems like it's the same phase transition, and we should await uh, lattice for experimental confirmation. Okay? Any questions about it? Yes? So, uh, the bosonic model, uh, namely this side, in a limit, which is large m head squared, describes a very slowly moving anions uh, well, uh, very slowly moving fermions, heavy fermions, spin and half fermions. And then when you lower the mass, these things become uh, dynamical, they fluctuate, and uh, you get a phase transition. And the claim is that this phase transition is the, in the universality class of the free fermion theory. It's a non-obvious claim, but uh, one may hope that this is correct. It passes a uh, Various consistency checks, not just this one, but also additional ones that, uh, that I have not explained. Uh, there are several more consistency checks that you can run. Any other questions? Exactly. You gotta get the free, free massless fermion. On, on this side, you get manifestly a free massless fermion. And on this side, you get some complicated interacting theory of uh, 
anions, but it's really just a spin and a half anion. And one should hope for the best. It's a conjecture. It may or may not be right. But it passes many consistency checks and it fits into a bigger picture of dualities and so one should be optimistic. <laughs> Probably nothing. If it's a second order phase transition, uh, it matches all the discrete, I mean, it matches all the discrete anomalies, it matches all the counter term jumps. Uh, so it matches qualitatively the number of relevant operators you expect. So yeah, uh, I mean, if it's second order transition, it's very likely that this is correct. Any other questions? They're not the same. The Lagrangians, the whole point of duality is that the Lagrangians look extremely different. But the yeah. physics is the same. The physics is the same. Even, even the, CFT the CFT point is an abstract algebraic point, which has some operators with some correlation functions and scaling dimensions. But the two Lagrangians that lead to that fixed point are utterly different. Oh, that would be like a proof. Nobody was able to do it. If you could find the field redefinition near the fixed point, you would prove it. Nobody was able to do it. The field redefinition, if any, must be extremely non-local. This is already seen from this formula. I mean, psi maps to some composite operator made out of the monopole and the scalar field. And similarly, phi would be some non-local defect in the fermionic theory. It would have to be an extremely non-local transformation of variables. There is, no, there is no simple transformation of variables that you can even fathom at the qualitative level that would reproduce that. Okay? So there is no obvious way to proceed, except that we have to wait for people to be able to simulate it on the computer and check if this is true. Or in the lab, simulate it in the lab. Any other questions? Yes. Has which symmetry? Yes. One model has a gauge symmetry and the other does not. And the same is true here. This model is a gauge field, gauge, Chern Simons gauge field theory, and the other side is just a free fermion theory. Well, uh, one of the deep lessons from these dualities is that the gauge symmetry is fictitious. The great gauge symmetry is a convenient way to say that we have a big Hilbert space and the, field, the actual Hilbert space is a quotient of the big Hilbert space by, the, by something. But if you have a physical space that you can describe either by a quotient or by something else, the quotient is not physical. You have a nice space, which is like a set of particles or correlation functions, and it's convenient to describe that space perhaps with a quotient, but if you have another description which does not involve a quotient, so don't use a quotient, okay? So the, now, in weak coupling, it, what I said is not true, of course, because gauge symmetry also leads to a massive spin one particle, which is massless, so you have a photon. So in the previous example, you can ask, okay, well, how does the duality even make sense? There is a photon. But the point is that at long distances, there is no photon. The photon is something that appears approximately the photon is like an artifact of, uh, you know, the photon would appear as a good uh, object at high energies, but it's an infrared duality, so there is no photon. And besides, in two plus one dimensions, the photon is a Goldstone particle, so the whole thing is not entirely shocking, because there was a Goldstone particle on the other side of the duality. Any other questions? Okay. I want to teach you another concept, and then we'll go the last, so how much more time have I got? I have a half an hour, oh no, a little bit more, 45 minutes? Half an hour, okay. Um, I want to teach you one last concept, which is surprising. It's just a general fact that's very useful in this business of, I won't teach you more dualities. Uh, there are many more dualities of this sort where boson fermion, bosons get transmuted to fermions, fermions get transmuted to other fermions, or bosons get transmuted to other bosons. It's a, there's a huge network 
of such dualities. What I want to do now is to spend five minutes just outlining uh, some such dualities, and then I want to teach you a, an interesting concept about emergence of symmetries, which is important for some of these dualities. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, the question here was whether these dualities have applications. So, uh, there is an interesting example. I'll just write it down. I won't explain where it comes from, I'll just write it down. So, if you study U1 level 2, a churn Simon's matter theory coupled to a fermion of charge 2, this model of U1 level 2 churn Simon's matter theory coupled to a fermion of charge 2. This model is very closely related, though not exactly the same as um, the quantum Hall, fractional quantum Hall effect at nu equals 5 halves. A 3 halves, sorry. I don't remember if it's 5 halves or 3 halves. Or whatever. This is this. Uh, no, this is a half filling. Yes, at half filling. This is, this is very closely related. Uh, to, so condensed matter people have argued that the quantum, fractional quantum Hall effect at a half filling uh, is closely related to this model, though it's not exactly the same. I'm omitting some technical details. And then they've uh, measured experimentally the, some properties of that uh, state, and they found that the critical exponents look like that of free field theory. And indeed, one of the special cases of the duality is that this is in fact dual to some topological field theory which you can tensor with a free fermion. So this kind of duality, you can run this whole machinery, find the map of operators, uh, study the massive phases, essentially the same ideas that I've taught you, but a little bit more advanced, and you find this kind of duality. So this explains why, for example, the critical exponents and the transport coefficients in this uh, complicated interacting state appears to be like a free fermion. That's one example. Other examples could have to do with the bootstrap. Uh, for example, if there are claims of duality like this, you can try to do Hamiltonian truncation and try to check if it works. So there could be multiple applications. I, uh, uh, there are some concrete applications of condensed matter, but uh, typically these dualities have many far-reaching applications. Uh, it's hard to say exactly what would be the most promising application of. Okay. Any other questions? So I just want to spend uh, a little bit of time on a, a concept which is a, a very important in some of these dualities and also very important in uh, high energy physics, in, in various applications in high energy physics, which is the emergence of symmetries in the quantum theory. Emergence of symmetries. Let me explain why. So this is a little bit disconnected from our previous discussion, but it's an important development, recent development that would be nice for you to know. And uh, for example, to understand this duality, this is absolutely crucial. If you, if you don't understand that, you, you have no chance of discovering this duality. So ordinarily, as you know, there, are, there is the concept of ABG anomalies. Do you know about ABG anomalies? Okay, so there is a concept where axial, some symmetries of a classical Lagrangian may be violated by quantum effects. Do you know about this? Ah, this is called the ABG anomaly. So this is the concept that some axial symmetries are violated in, quantum, violated in the quantum theory. In quantum field theory. Uh, is everybody familiar with this idea? No? Okay. So perhaps I should skip that topic if, uh, if many people are not familiar with this idea. Well, I'll teach you the idea nevertheless, but you won't, perhaps you won't understand why it's surprising if you don't know the background, the historical background. So let me just, uh, so I'll teach you the idea nevertheless. Let 
let's consider level k churn Simon's theory. Okay, so that's the, the, the object we already studied in some detail. So uh, it has anions which are labeled by zero, one, and let's say that k is even. I'll take k to be even to simplify my life. So until we go all the way to k minus one. So we have anions that are labeled by these integers. And their spins are, their spins are one over two k, and uh, sorry, their spins are zero, and then one over two k, four over two k, all the way, uh, well, to uh, k minus one squared over two k. So I'll write it as k minus one squared over two k, which I can. And these are defined mod one. So an important fact about chern simons theory in general is that it, because it has an epsilon tensor, it's not invariant under parity or time reversal symmetry. So generally, this, is not, this action is non-invariant, time reversal non-invariant. If you do a time reversal transformation, k goes to minus k because there is an epsilon tensor. And the theory with k and the theory with minus k are not equivalent. So the theories with k and minus k are non-equivalent. Let me show you an example. So remember that the spins are defined mod one. So let's see why k and minus k are not equivalent. Let's take k equals four. just some generic even number. So the list of spins is gonna be zero, and then one over eight, and then four over eight, and then nine over eight, and then this is three, four squared, and then zero again, four squared over eight. Yeah, this is mod one. This are so this is the list of spins, mod one. I can simplify it a little bit, mod one. So this is a half, and this is minus one over eight. Oh, sorry, this is plus one over eight. Right. Is that correct? These are the spins, mod one. Now let's compare, let's, co let's compare this with k minus, equals minus, minus four. So we have zero. Then we have minus one over eight, minus a half, and minus one over eight again, and zero. So you see that the list of spins and also the braiding phases is not invariant under k going to minus k. This list of spins and this list of spins is not the same mod one. So these are truly different anions. In addition, the braiding phases uh, look like e to the two pi i q q prime over k. And if you take k to minus k, these are not the same braiding phases. Hmm? How would you change k to minus k by field redefinition? A is a real connection. So in general, because there is an epsilon tensor, these theories are not invariant under time reversal symmetry. But there are some special cases in which they become time reversal invariant. So there are some sparse choices of K where they become time reversal invariant. And the most, uh, well, the case that's relevant for this business is K equals two. So let's consider K equals two on this blackboard. So K equals two is an accidental uh, situation where in spite of the fact that the classical action is not invariant, the full quantum theory is invariant. So th that's the deep uh, like concept here that's not, uh, extremely non-intuitive if you've studied a little bit of quantum field theory before. So there is a symmetry which is not a symmetry of the classical theory, but it's a symmetry of the full quantum theory. How is that even possible? 
quantum effects may destroy symmetry because quantum effects are small, but how can quantum effects restore symmetry that's not a symmetry of the classical theory? So let me show you an example, which is k equals two. So the k equals two model classically is not time reversal invariant, at least at face value. But if you look at the, there are two anions, uh, there are two particles, uh, namely zero, let's call the particles say one and s. So the spins for k equals two, uh, the spins are uh, zero and a quarter. Uh, yeah, the spins are zero and a quarter. And the braiding phases of S and S, if you braid S across S, you get e to the pi i. If you braid S across one, you get one. And if you braid one across one, you get one. So this is the only non-trivial braiding phase. But now let's contrast it with k equals minus two. For k equals minus two, the spins are uh, zero and minus a quarter. And the braiding phases are S twiddle across S twiddle and we get e to the minus pi i. But it so happens that e to the pi i and e to the minus pi i are the same thing. So we have one braiding phase that's common. The spins do not completely agree. So this is a small, uh, an important subtlety that uh, to make this theory truly time reversal invariant, we have to tensor it with u1 level one, which is a trivial theory, which has a spin a half. And then uh, the braiding phases do not change and you can map this series to, you can map all the anions to all the anions here and all the braiding phases to all the braiding phases here. And these theories are exactly equivalent. So if you take U1 level two and you make it into a spin theory by tensoring it, tensoring it with U1 level one, the theory gains time reversal symmetry quantum mechanically, which is uh, somewhat counterintuitive given uh, perhaps your intuition about the time reversal symmetry in quantum field theory. So the resolution for this paradox is that Chern-Simons theory doesn't really have a classical limit. Okay? Chern-Simons theory doesn't have propagating degrees of freedom. And so the whole theory is quantum somehow from the get-go. Quantum effects are of order one. So uh, there is no, since there is no classical limit, perhaps uh, we shouldn't have expected that the symmetries would have anything to do with the classical symmetries. So that's an important concept that appears in many generalizations of the dualities that I've shown you here. It's a little bit more advanced, but I just wanted to mention that so that you would know that, it, that this subject exists. Yeah. So the uh, question is, what is the, what is the classical limit? And what is, if, you were, uh, if you were to just study classic uh, chern simons theory uh, as a classical field theory, then we have the equations of motion. So the equation of motion is this. The field strength vanishes, right? And so uh, what is there to discuss? Uh, you cannot form coherent states. The classical limit is typically something like about coherent states or uh, excitations with a large uh, energy density. Okay. The Hamiltonian vanishes and the field strength vanishes. So somehow the theory, the contents of chern simons theory is really just a finite number of states in the Hilbert space in compact space. Um, yeah, there is like no oscillators. There is no large frequency. There is none of that. Yeah, k goes to infinity is a classical limit. And indeed for large, you know, generic k, there are no enhanced symmetries. It's a sparse thing about very special values of k, in particular k equals two. And this uh, fact about k equals two is very important in condensed matter as well as in particle physics. Um, so this theory where you tensor one comma s to with one comma one, it's known in the, if you wanna learn more about it, uh, I, I won't discuss it anymore. It's called the, the semion fermion theory. And it has uh, many applications. And the fact that it has time reversal symmetry is important in many applications. Okay, so I want, yeah. So the yeah, we did that. You remember that we had the slave particles? Right, 
Right, right. When, when you have uh, some particles uh, that are moving, then you have some sort of classical limit, which are these particles. But I'm just talking here about properties of uh, the pure churn Simons theory. If you take U1 level 2 or U1 level 1, uh, for example, U1 level 1 is a trivial theory. But once you couple U1 level 1 to matter field, it gains a lot of interesting dynamics. In fact, with this duality that we discussed here, uh, I mean, yeah, this duality was about the dynamics of Q1 level 1 plus matter fields. So U1 level 1 by itself is, uh, is trivial, but once you couple it to matter fields, it's able to turn scalars to fermions, bosons to fermions, and it leads to lots of interesting dynamics. Similarly, U1 level 2 gains this, uh, this quantum time reversal symmetry only when it's on its own. When it's coupled to matter fields, it's not time reversal invariant. U1 level 2 plus a scalar field or seven scalar fields. It's not necessarily the same as U1 level minus 2 plus seven scalar fields. It's a property of the pure Chern Simons theory. Okay? Any other questions? Okay. So now I want to start my uh, last topic, which I will continue through tomorrow. My last topic is going to be about QCD, where I'll try to So the last topic that I want to discuss uh, is non-abelian gauge dynamics in the three dimensions with uh, perhaps some uh, quarks, okay? So non-abelian gauge dynamics in 3D. So uh, first, I want to remind you of some uh, of our expectations about non-abelian gauge dynamics in four dimensions so that you could appreciate more the novelties that appear in three dimensions. So I'll start, because I have, uh, I guess, 10, 15 minutes, right? I'll start with a review of four-dimensional QCD, of you know, what we call qualitatively expect from four-dimensional QCD, and then uh, we'll discuss the new ingredients that come to play in three dimensions. So, well, let's start from a review of four dimensions. So the Lagrangian for QCD in four dimensions is one over four G squared. Then there is a trace of F squared. That's the kinetic term. Then we have a bunch of fermions. And possibly a mass term, a mass for the fermions. This is four-dimensional QCD with the NF quarks. So I'm assuming that the index I, I runs from one to an F. And there is a sum here too. So this is QCD with NF massive quarks. Hmm? Uh, psi tilde. Oh yeah, thank you so much. So this is the SUN gauge theory coupled to NF heavy or massive, massive quarks. Now for the more advanced students, uh, I should say that in principle, 
the mass here could be any complex number. But to not, I want to just review quick uh, important properties of the theory, and therefore I'll just focus on positive mass. I'll just assume that m is a positive parameter. This is very important, and you lose generality by doing that, but it, uh, otherwise the phenomenology of this model is too complicated. So I'll just restrict to positive, or I guess non-negative, uh, uh, non-negative uh, masses. Just not to lose a general, just not to make it overly complicated. So no negative masses. Okay, so this is the setup. Just wanted, that's what I want to review. And furthermore, I have made another simplifying assumption here, which is that all the quarks have the exact same mass. This is done in order to preserve like as much symmetry as I can, not to complicate things. So this model has SUNF global symmetry times U1 baryon. This is the non-anomalous symmetry of the model. So SUNF rotates the quarks, and U1 baryon just rephases all the quarks. Okay, so what is the phenomenology of this model? So we know the answer more or less from lattice and from real life. As you know, some special case of this model is highly relevant for real life uh, QCD physics. Uh, so we know the answer uh, in some, uh, from this. So first of all, when the mass is a, uh, sorry, when this mass is positive, then uh, it's uh, widely believed that for all and F, the theory just confines, confined and gap in the infrared. Okay, so you just, so when, when the mass is positive, you form some bound states and the theory is always confined and gap. M equals zero is a more, much more interesting uh, situation. Are there any questions about the positive mass? Same, is does that conflict with something you know or don't know? And, okay. So for m equals zero, there is a, the phenomenology is richer, since when the mass is zero, the psi twiddle fermions and the psi fermions are decoupled from each other. There is no term in the Lagrangian that contains both, and therefore there is a bigger symmetry. There is SUNF times SUNF times U1 baryon. And here the story is more complicated. So here the phenomenology of the model depends very sensitively on NF. Okay. Uh, and the, so for NF that is bigger than 11 over 3 NC, Eleven over two. Sorry. Yeah. For an F that's bigger than eleven over two NC, uh, the theory is believed to flow to a weakly interacting theory of uh, spin one particles and fermions. So this is infrared free. This phase is called the infrared free phase. Uh, in the infrared free phase, you just have a weakly interacting, almost free, uh, quarks. Free deconfined quarks and so, so free deconfined quarks and uh, gluons. That's what happens for sufficiently large NF. Then there is some intermediate value of NF which is not really known. Uh, it's Probably around uh, three, probably around uh, three and C, but it's not exactly known. And here there is a second order transition, so there is a conformal field theory. Here there is a second order transition and a conformal field theory. So the model flows to some interacting conformal field theory at long distances. And for an F, for an F equals zero. Of course, 
it's the same as this, so this is confined. And f equals zero is just confined, uh, because it's very similar to, to having masked quarks. It's as if you don't have any quarks. Yeah? This condition is exactly at the same term, or all the way to the No, for everywhere here, everywhere here, you are confusing it with the diagrams that I used to draw for M. Let me explain that point. So phase transitions happen as a function of continuous parameters, and F is not a parameter. And so when I say phase transition, I have to tell you between what, what, which two phases. So this is a more advanced question. I'll just, um, so imagine that M was allowed to be any real parameter, not just non-negative parameter. So you can argue that there are two vacua here and one vacuum here, and it's exactly M equals zero. We have a certain fixed point. And that's that fixed point. So that fixed point here is supposed to appear when you dial the mass of the quarks from being negative to being positive, okay? So in this range, this fixed point is interacting. In this range, this fixed point is free. And in this range, there is no fixed point. In this range, uh, you just get number Goldstone bosons for some symmetry breaking. So here, so here what we get is that uh, we have SUN F times SUN F is uh, spontaneously broken to SUNF. This, uh, this leads to the pions and, and kaons that we observe in real life for an F equal three. So here there is symmetry breaking. So in summary, the dynamics of four-dimensional QCD is easy for finite mass. It's always confined and trivial. It's non-trivial for zero mass, and we have a complicated phenomenology of a, either a second order transition or a number Goldstone phase um, uh, when you change the mass from being positive to being negative. And there is a, yeah, there is a, an interesting pattern of symmetry breaking, where SUNF times SUNF is broken to the diagonal symmetry by some condensation of fermions. The order parameter for the symmetry breaking is a psi twiddle psi, which is a, in some basis, uh, the unit matrix, and that condensate leads to the fact that SUNF times SUNF is only preserved, so the vacuum only preserves the diagonal subgroup of SUNF times SUNF. Okay, so what you have to remember from this discussion, if you don't know these things, is that in 4D, finite mass is easy, everything is determined by an F, and there is an infrared free phase, a conformal phase, and a symmetry breaking phase. Yes? Uh, this is determined by a combination of experiments because we live for, a, you know, we live uh, where in, a, in, a, in a universe where NC is three and then F is approximately three. So we are somewhere here and we know that this is true. It's because there are pions and kaons. Then lattice people have done uh, simulations in this window, in this window, and this we know from the work of Gross, Wilczek. Oh, that's embarrassing. I forgot the third person. I'm blanking out, I cannot. I forgot. So this is determined by the fact that the beta function is uh, positive. So the infrared physics is weakly coupled. So we know this analytically. We know this is true almost analytically and from lattice simulations, we don't know where this happens. And we know this from experiment and lattice simulations. Who are the two people who are in this? Gross and Wilczek. Politzer is the third, thanks. So this is the computation, this is the computation, this is the work of uh, the Gross, Wilczek, and Politzer. Uh, who computed the beta function and found that it's positive for an F bigger than 11 and a half times NC. Okay, so next time I'll introduce the ingredients in QCD in three dimensions. It will be a more advanced lecture than my previous three lectures. It will be harder to follow, but it's important to explain this material uh, since there is lots of work on it uh, recently. Um, and so I'll try to explain what is known about the phase diagram of QCD in three dimensions and what are the open questions. <laughs> Any more questions?
going to take a break and then a few minutes and then we'll come back to the rest of the Yeah, yeah, I mean, I cannot, but people are working on it.